I sit in the back so it prolongs the applause. <laughs> it's an old gimmick. <laughs> well, I'm really, really honored to be here. And uh, it's rare, I want to be very open with you, but those of you who know me from the radio know I am very open. So this is my Sabbath, my Shabbat. So I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. It's very, uh, it's, it's pretty rare that I do speak on Shabbat. I'm, I, pr I prefer generally to be home and to have Shabbat there and to uh, have it with my community in my synagogue. But this is so important and so God-centered. I think, I, I trust God will forgive me. Uh, and I mean that quite literally, but that is how important I consider uh, this, this to be, and I thank you for having me. So, let me talk to you about what is happening, what I believe is the, the crisis of uh, our time, and uh, it is with re regard to God. It is rarely, when we talk about the culture wars, we rarely speak about them with regard to the fundamental issue, which I am convinced is ultimately God. So let me talk to you about what I think my life's work has been, and I have said this on the radio very often. If I had to summarize my life's work, it has been to explain to people the consequences of secularism, the consequences of godlessness, because it is not talked about. Most conservatives couldn't care less about this issue. Most conservatives are secular as well. Those of us who are conservative and religious is getting smaller and smaller. And the only hope I think for America lies with those of us who understand that it's the Judeo-Christian value issue more than any other single issue. Let me tell you uh, some of the epiphanies, the biggest epiphany I came to. You can see it on the internet. It's an article I wrote very many years ago, How I Found God at Columbia. My graduate school was Columbia University, and I was taught a lot of nonsense. And it puzzled me a great deal, why are brilliant people teaching me nonsense? Because my life is about why. I, I need to understand, if I was on the Titanic, I know I would be preoccupied with why I'm drowning. Not that I am drowning, but why am I drowning? Or am I, why am I about to drown? I want to know why. So I had no answer, and then, believe it or not, walking through the Columbia campus one uh, afternoon, to the extent that there is a campus there, it's just located in, in, in Manhattan, and I give you my word, this is how it happened. All of a sudden, a phrase that I had said from the Bible in Jewish school, I went to Jewish school till I was 18, and I mean Jewish school, I mean half the day in Hebrew and half the day in English. So it was called, it's called the yeshiva. It's very, very serious immersion. And I, uh, the phrase came to mind in Hebrew, Reshit Chochmai Yirat Adonai, wisdom begins with fear of God. We had, I had said it in kindergarten and first grade and second grade. It's just part of the, the morning prayer. But, it's called, but it was by rote. In other words, it, didn't, it never registered with me what it meant. And then at Columbia, it registered with me. The reason I'm getting no wisdom at Columbia is that there is no God at Columbia. That phrase was completely accurate. Wisdom begins with fear of God. No God, no wisdom. And the most godless place in America is the least wise place in America, the university. The university today, and for that matter, the high school, and for that matter, the elementary school, is actually a place of anti-wisdom. You, you learn, and I, I say this on the radio, and I say this to in, fellow intellectuals, you learn to be stupid. 
And I, I don't mean it as a joke. I don't mean it in, in a hyperbolic way. You learn to be foolish. You get a BA in foolishness, a master's in foolishness, and a PhD in foolishness. When I was at Columbia, I was taught, my field was international relations, I was taught the United States and the Soviet Union were equally responsible for the Cold War. The mass murderer Stalin and Truman were equally responsible for, for the Cold War. It is morally sick to speak that way. We were taught the imagery, you could look it up, there was this imagery, <coughs> excuse me, there was this imagery of two scorpions in a bottle. That was it. No, there wasn't good versus evil, it was two scorpions in a bottle battling it out. Two superpower scorpions. That was it. That was the entirety of, of, the, of the message. Then I was taught, of course, that men and women are basically the same which I knew immediately was nonsense, pure nonsense. And that's, th there were so many other things that I was taught. And of course, how an America is an imperialist country, y you name it. And now today, you, just a list of, fa of falsehoods and moral sickness. Israel is the villain in the Middle East. It's, it's just a series of falsehoods that is taught. The universities were set up, every university in America was set up to teach about God, among other things. Theology was, the, was a required course. You would have mathematics, you would have philosophy, you would have science, and you would have theology. The insignia of Yale University to this day, although I suspect they'll drop it, is the chief priest wore a, a frontlet, a sort of plaque on his body, and it said Urim Vitumim. The, and in Hebrew, that is it. The, the priest, the high priest's plaque that he wore in Hebrew is the insignia of Yale University. That is how profoundly biblical the origins of Yale were, or are. In Harvard, you could not get a BA till 1800 if you did not speak Hebrew, because you had to be able to read the Old Testament. And it, it goes on and on. The, the, uh, the United States of America is a God, was set up to be a God-centered country. And I explained to atheists and to secular liberals why. Why conservatism cannot survive without God. Even if you think God is made up, it's still, you still need God. Because the bigger the God, the smaller the state. And the bigger the state, the, the smaller the God. That's why there's no God in Western Europe. The state has taken everything over. Instead of fear of God, you have fear of state. Because people understand you have to fear something. The human being has to be controlled in, morally in some way. So you either feel morally accountable to God or morally accountable to the state and its police. We have opted, as we have gotten more secular, to have people fear and fear, uh, feel accountable to the state and not to God. The founders believed, and remember this is the only country in the history of the world that was founded on the belief of a, of a limited government. No other country to this day has ever been founded on that belief. And there is a counter-revolution. The American Revolution is literally being undone. It is being undone by people on the left. And I, I explain it in the following way. The America has a trinity just as Christianity has a trinity. The American trinity I did not make up. It is on every one of your coins. Liberty, in God we trust, e pluribus unum. That is the, what I call the American Trinity. Everyone is being undone. We are substituting equality for liberty. We are substituting godlessness and secularism for in God we trust. 
and we are substituting multiculturalism for e pluribus unum. E pluribus unum means from many one. That is completely rejected today. Today, it, the motto would be transferred to from many, many. Not from many, one. On Flag Day, a few years ago, where I live in Los Angeles, one of the high schools told the students, now remember, Flag Day is to celebrate the American flag. They told the students, it's Flag Day, bring in the flag from which your parents or grandparents came. So they proudly had Flag Day as the antithesis of what Flag Day was set up to be. It was set up to celebrate the American flag and instead you had 30 different countries' flags. The concept of the melting pot is dead. The concept of in God we trust is dead and the concept of liberty is dead. 49% of millennials do not believe in free speech for hate speech. This comes from the Brookings Institute, this comes from uh, the uh, Pew uh, 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 Institute or what, the Pew Polling Service. This is not from conservative sources. Now, the, please, you must understand the idea of I don't believe in, free, I believe in free speech except for hate speech is moronic. It means nothing. The whole point of free speech is for speech you don't like. What do you believe in? Free speech for love speech? Of course, he, when I was a kid, Nazis marched in Skokie, Illinois. Skokie, they picked Skokie because a lot of Jewish Holocaust survivors lived there. So to, to rub it in their face, they marched with swastikas. They were allowed to do so. Nazis were allowed to march in a, in a uh, suburb of Chicago where not only Jews but Holocaust survivors lived. It's the ultimate hate speech. Nazis march, marching in front of people who suffered in Auschwitz. But that's allowed and I agree with it. That's the way it is. But not now, not now. And hate speech, by the way, is now not just Nazis. It's anybody that the left differs with. Anybody. E, so liberty in God we trust, e pluribus unum, the American Revolution is being undone. And it ultimately comes down to, even though most conservatives don't know it, you do. But you and I are in the minority. We're even in the minority among conservatives to understand that this is ultimately a religious issue. Conservatism will not survive the death of God any more than America will. But they don't know it because they went to the same Columbia's and the same UCLA's and the same University of Michigan's as, as, as the secular do. They got the exact same brainwash, just they happen to believe in, in limited government and more freedom, which is wonderful. They're my allies in those battles. But in, but in the ultimate analysis, they don't understand that, that it is the God issue. The God issue is everything. The religious issue is everything. Without God, I, I read a piece from the Wall Street Journal that just came out last month. There was a review of a book by a professor of philosophy in South Africa whose thesis is life, we need to grow up and acknowledge life is completely meaningless. In fact, and he's right, that's the irony, he's right. But here's the interesting thing, the reviewer agreed with him because the reviewer was another professor, an American professor, who said that, you know, he's right, life is meaningless. But we can't live as if it's meaningless, so we make up meaning, which is existentialism. That's fine. Nobody can look in the mirror and say, how you doing meaningless? It's not possible. You're just, you are, you are as unimportant as a pebble uh, on Mars. People are not prepared to say that, so they will make up. And she said, okay, now, the, the writer who wrote the review said, okay, now I'm going to do my meaningful thing for the day and make breakfast. And it is, breakfast is meaningful. But of course, in, in the, in the, it, it doesn't answer the question, is life meaningful? Breakfast is meaningful, breakfast is meaningful to a tortoise. 
That doesn't matter, uh, obviously. The question is not, is breakfast meaningful? The question is, is life meaningful? And she, the reviewer, acknowledged it isn't. By the way, the professor who wrote the book is actually, he is anti-birth. He, th he, he thinks, not only does he think abortion is okay, he thinks abortion is morally an imperative. People should not have children. And his argument is follows. Everyone suffers, and it is immoral, therefore, to bring into the world a sentient being that will suffer. So he is, he is for the extinction of the human race, which is a totally logical inference to draw from the meaninglessness of life if there is no God. The man is completely consistent. If there's no purpose to human life, why produce any more of it? There's so much suffering in every human life, why even bother? And that makes sense. And incidentally, that's exactly what's happening. Again, what did I learn in college and what will you still learn in college? Why do people have fewer children than, than in the past? Because they're, they're more affluent. The reason people have fewer children is affluence. But of course, these are secular people writing this. They don't understand that's not the major reason. The major reason is they're secular, not they're rich. Rich religious people have a lot of children. If you meet a family with six children, you can bet your house they are either a Mormon or an evangelical Christian or a, a, a traditional Catholic or an Orthodox Jew. I have not met a secular family with six or more children. I'm sure one exists, but I haven't met one. The ultimate affirmation of life's meaningless is the decision the decision, people who can't have children can't have children, but the decision not to have children. It is, and that's why Europe is disappearing. Europe is disappearing philosophically, religiously, morally, and demographically. Countries are disappearing as they become radically secularized. They don't have children. Germans don't have children. Germans don't have children so much. Germany, this, I've heard no one else make this point, but it may be, it, this is actually a possibility which would be really eerie. There may be more Jews at the end of the 21st century than Germans. It's eerie. It's just eerie. They are disappearing. That is the reason for the crisis. They brought in 3,500,000 Turks to begin with in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, because they, they, they just didn't have young people, and they don't make young people now. And we're not making young people in the United States. Why well, get married? In every area of life, every crisis is ultimately a God crisis. I spoke about the murderer in Las Vegas. Because we have zero notion of a motive. And I, I have zero, mo I don't have any knowledge you don't have. But based on what I read, I, 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 did, I do believe the following, this is my tentative explanation. The man grew up at, at seven years of age, his mother told him, he was the oldest of four children. He, the mother told them, your dad died which is a trauma enough for a child. But he didn't die. He was sent away to prison. His father was one of the 10 most wanted criminals in the United States, described by, at the time by the FBI as a psychopath. So he was a psychopath. It's not good to be the child of a psychopath to begin with. But at the age of seven, where you're old enough to know something and still and yet young enough to be shattered, he was told this, and I don't blame the mother, she just did what she did. It's very traumatic for a child, for a boy in particular, to have a bad father. That is why Bernie Madoff's son, who was in his 30s or 40s, killed himself. It's actually much worse to have a bad father than to have a bad son. For whatever reason, 
it's, we don't we don't realize perhaps the, the power of fathers in, in kids' lives. The power in, in a girl's life is great as well, but it's just different. Because the boy obviously identifies with the father being a male. I think that he was so angry, he found out in his 20s, still a very, a very traumatic time to find out something. Your father didn't die, he abandoned you, and he's a psychopathic criminal. I believe he became a loner. All descriptions of him as a loner, it's always a bad sign, and every mass murderer turns out to have been a loner. And I believe that his anger at his father, all the children hate the father. This was in the piece that I read yesterday on the air. All of them hate him. And one of them took it out on others. Bernie Madoff's kid took it out on himself. But this guy's kid took it out on 58, actually 558 people. The, the, now what does this have to do with anything I said on the air? I said, it is very bad to not have a father on earth but people who don't have a father on earth can at least have a father in heaven. But this guy had no father on earth and no father in heaven. That's a big deal. Our society won't acknowledge it. It sounds so unsophisticated. You know, it, they, they never allow a religious thought into a university because it's, it's considered stupid. It's considered foolish. But without God, all, all is lost. All is meaningless. G.K. Chesterton, is to him it's attributed the quote, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. When I see the substitute religions that people believe in, do you believe that people are walking around saying there is no such thing as a male, no such thing as a female? Kids are now addressed as students because teachers are told do not call your first graders boys and girls. Let them choose the sex they want to be when they're older. Do you understand what is going on? And it is all produced by an, a, a, a radical secularism that is rampant in our society. People just become foolish. Let me tell you one more thing about that because this is big. I am, I've been working for 35 years on a commentary on the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, for people of every faith and no faith. My first volume is coming out in April for Easter and Passover, Exodus. It'll be, a, it'll be 100,000 words. To explain and explain and explain, one of the discoveries I made is that the Torah, which is your Bible as much as mine, the Torah is founded on the concept of distinctions. And when you obliterate distinctions, you are really obliterating the maker of distinctions, the orderer of order, the creator. It's a great riddle I've asked r religious audiences, what did God create on the second day? And almost nobody, I didn't know, I didn't even have the answer when it was, when it was posed to me and I'd studied this my whole life, I never thought of it. What did God create on the second day? And the answer is separations between light and dark, water and land, Separations. Separations is everything. So here let me give you an examples of how there is a war against distinctions which is ultimately a war against the creator of order, the creator of distinctions. The male-female distinction is right now the most obvious. There is a war against the male-female distinction. When God creates the human being, the Torah says, the Genesis says, Zachar unikeva bara otam. Male and female, he created them. 
God does not say that about animals. Animals have male and female, but the distinction matters in the human being. There's no such thing as a human being who is not male or a human being who is not female. This is the way God wanted it. Now, I, I acknowledge that there are people with psychological conditions that have sexual dysphoria, gender dysphoria, I, and my heart goes out to them. If I were born with this body and thought that I was a female, I, I, I would be in terrible pain. People who are in pain deserve our sympathy, but you can't undo the, the knowledge that there is male and female in the human species. Compassion does not demand that we lie about one of the important truths of life. You give compassion and you stick to truth. There was a video up at the, at the uh, website that I founded five years ago called Prager University. This year we, have, we will have over 500 million views. It's the most viewed conservative website in the world. And thank you. And our, our video last week was given, uh, uh, was dedicated to this issue and the woman who gave it taught me something I did not know. I've, I've learned from every course, they're all five minutes. And by the way, the largest single segment of viewers are under 35 years of age. That's, that's really the, the great news. And uh, she told the story, this happened just a couple of years ago, mixed martial arts, you know, where they can punch each other and kick each other and so on. It's, it's very popular and they're very strong, these people. And a man who said he's a woman was therefore allowed to fight as a woman. He beat up the woman he fought so terribly she was hospitalized and there, there was a fear she would suffer brain damage. She said, I am the strongest woman I know and, and I had never encountered anything like this. Of course she didn't, because men are stronger than women. Of course she never encountered anything like it. Now why is that fair? Do they talk about fairness? Just tell me why is that fair? I have no problem if this man walks around like a woman, looks like a woman, talks like a woman, and has a, a female name. I don't care if he started out as male, I will address you as Evelyn. That's fine, I don't have an issue with that. But I won't let you fight another woman because the issue in fighting is, is not what you feel about yourself, it's what are you biologically. Anyway, the war against the male-female distinction began when I was already in college because they said there's no difference between men and women. That was the essential feminist notion. There is no difference between male and female. This is what was taught. Now we've gone a step further. There is not only no difference between male and female, but you, you are whatever you think you are. The, the male and female don't even exist. That is one distinction. Remember there is, you may not know this, but it is huge. And when I come to, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, when I come to that book, I may be wrong uh, which book it's in, there is, but there is a law, a man may not wear women's clothing and a woman may not wear the, uh, what pertains to men. There is a biblical imperative that we maintain the male-female distinction. Second distinction that is being obliterated, good and evil. Good is what you say it is, it's just like gender. It's what you say it is and what I say it is and that's it. There is no objective good and evil because there's only objective good and evil if God is the source of morality. If God says do not murder, murder is wrong. If God does not say murder is wrong, murder isn't wrong. It doesn't mean that all atheists murder or that all religious people are wonderful. People find this a little too complex because they went to college and they learned not to think. Uh, no, I know this because I did this video. I don't do most of the Prager University videos. I do 15% of them. But I did the one on if God doesn't say do not murder, murder isn't wrong. And you should read the comments not just the comments attacking me and the idea, uh, which you can, it's just, it's all up there on YouTube. 
But you, they, there, are, there are about a dozen other videos made just attacking me for saying that, even though every atheist philosopher acknowledges it. If there is no God, ethics are subjective. But these people don't even understand that. God, is, God says X is wrong, then X is wrong. If there is no God, you say X is wrong, but I say X is right. And that ends the issue. That's the second distinction that is being warned against. The third, holy and profane. There, this is huge. The word for holy in Hebrew means separate. Kadosh means separate. When public officials curse publicly, most people curse periodically, privately. And to be honest, I just want to say that if a piano falls on your toe and you say, gosh darn it, you are a hero in my eyes. Okay? I have no issue if something, if an expletive comes out from you if a piano falls on your foot. So I, 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 I'm not, I'm not uh, radical uh, conservative in this matter, but publicly, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. I don't think privately it's a good thing either, but publicly in particular, it is wrong. We had laws against public cursing in the country because there was an understanding that th that, you know what cursing is? This, I believe cursing is to society what broken windows are to a neighborhood. Do you know the theory of broken windows? James Q. Wilson and his associate at Harvard came up with this many years ago. It's very, very correct and brilliant and Rudy Giuliani fixed New York based on it. If you let broken windows go unrepaired and unprosecuted, in other words, the people who deliberately threw stones through those windows, nothing happens to them, the next step is violence and you end up with rape and murder. You better fix broken windows. I am totally convinced that public cursing is like, is to society what broken windows are to a neighborhood. You let that go, it will get ultimately violent. I, and you, by the way, it's been practiced. There is a Christian who is the warden of of uh, the uh, Louisiana State Prison, Angola. It is the largest state prison in the country. Before he took it over, you should read about this. This is very powerful. I visited Angola. I went on death row. Before he became the warden, it was the bloodiest prison in America. The number of murders, because murders were sent there, and the guards just didn't do anything. The warden, you know, this, they're just all violent. A Christian warden took over, set up a whole program where every person would study theology, would study the Bible, and even ultimately work, if they could, to ordination, or to a degree in biblical studies. Number two, he banned cursing. He banned cursing in, in a prison with murderers. He banned cursing. If guards cursed, they were punished. If inmates cursed, they were punished. It is now the safest state prison in the United States of America, thanks to what this warden did there. Set up biblical studies and stop cursing. That's how big it is. The death of the holy is another, another nail in the coffin of Western civilization. In the arts, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that aims for the holy. You look at a Michelangelo, and then you look at today. Do you know how much modern art is scatological? Scatological means related to uh, excretory functions. Do you know that uh, in, where I live in California, the Museum of Contemporary Art, big, the big modern art museum in Orange County, has a gigantic sculpture of a dog in front of the museum, leg up, with a permanent urination coming from his penis. 
That's, that's, what, that's what is the big sculpture at the biggest museum in Orange County, California. In Germany, one of the biggest art awards was given to an artist who sculpted a German policewoman crouching and urinating. Even the puddle is sculpted. It got some of the biggest prizes in Germany. The amount of art made from fecal matter, menstrual blood, and urine. The most prestigious museum in the United States might be the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Last year, it, it, its most famous exhibit was a pure gold, 100% pure gold toilet bowl which works. You pay, the patron, the visitor to the museum pays, uses the pure gold toilet. And guess what the name of the toilet is, of the exhibit? America. You get a chance to literally urinate and defecate on America. That's at the Guggenheim Museum, perhaps the country's most prestigious museum. The death of the holy, is that fair to say? Separation of male and female, separation of good and evil, separation of the holy and profane, separation of man and animal. We are created in God's image, animals are not. But with the death of God and the death of biblical values, humans and animals are equated I just spoke at a school, oh yeah, where was it? It was actually not, for me, not too far from here. For you, it'll be a little far. But it was, uh, it was as far, it was twice as far from Philadelphia as you are from Detroit. So it was quite out in, in, the, uh, in, in a rural area, but a wonderful school. And the head of the board of directors is a, a, a donor to Prager University and asked me to speak there and I went. I spoke to 6th grade to 12th grade and I asked what I have been asking since I began lecturing 40 years ago in my 20s. If your dog and a stranger were drowning, which would you say first? And virtually every single hand voted of course for the dog. Because in the secular age in which we live, the stranger is not worth more than a dog because you love your dog and you don't love the stranger. And the only thing you're taught to follow is love. There is no objective standard. You follow love. By the way, there was a Christian uh, class that came to hear me at the, the, uh, uh, in, in California at a speech at the Nixon Library, I think it was, and I asked them, and they all voted for the dog. And to his credit, the principal said, we got work to do. If kids in a Christian school are voting for the dog, we're in trouble. But don't feel bad, I asked this in a Jewish school and I got the same vote in Miami. And by the way, to their credit, the rabbi of the school came over to me, and this was in Miami, as I said, and said, we got work to do. Just like the Christian said in California. You do have work to do. I love my dogs with all respect more than I love any of you. But I want you to know, you can swim near me. <laughs> you do not have to worry because I would save you first. I would save you first not because I love you more than I love my dogs, but because you're a human being and they're a dog. You're created in God's image and they're not. It is as simple as that. PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, a radically secular organization, believes radically that humans and animals are of equal worth. I had their head on, Ingrid Newkirk, on my radio show. She believes cockroaches are as valuable as human beings. What did I begin my talk with? Wisdom begins with fear of God. You become stupid when God leaves. This is a perfect example. We're the equal. They are against, they are against killing a pig if the heart valve can save a human being. That's a direct, for, you may say, well, your, your drowning example is theoretical. This is not theoretical. Can we kill a pig to take its valve to save a human being? 
Peter says no. You ready for another thing? P Peter, by the way, is the largest, uh, largest pro-animal group in the United States, maybe the world. I'm not picking on some little obscure group. They have a program, it still exists, it's called Holocaust on Your Plate. And the program declares there is no difference between the barbecuing of billions of chickens in America and the, and the cremating of Jews in the Holocaust. How's that? A chicken, a Jew, who can choose? They're all college educated, needless to say. My point is, and I want to have time for you to ask questions. My point is everything goes back to the death of God and biblical values. It is your task as a religious American to make it clear to people. We have to argue with them on reason. I did not once in this talk say you have to believe. I never tell people you have to believe. I tell people the consequences of their not believing. Then you make your choice. Everything is a choice in life. By the way, and I tell that to people, you choose to believe. It's a choice. I chose to believe in God. And, and every day affirms the validity of that choice. But it was a choice. God did not appear to me. I made that choice and I have lived a life hopefully in accord with that choice. We need to explain why that is the moral, rational, good choice and ultimately the true choice. I asked Charles Krauthammer, who was an agnostic, who was uh, rendered quadriplegic when he was at Harvard Medical School in a diving accident. If anybody has reason to be an atheist, it's somebody who at 21 becomes a quadriplegic. Not him, he says he's agnostic. I said to him, so what do you think of atheism? This is, it's recorded. He said, I've heard of a lot of weird ideas, that's the weirdest. To say that everything came from nothing, that's truly absurd. This is an agnostic. Harvard Medical School and uh, you know major intellectual and a man who could easily have said there's no God if there was a God I wouldn't have gotten paralyzed when I was 21 so we're in a battle what I, I've called it, this a civil war in the United States I hope it stays nonviolent but I'm telling you it is a civil war we have less in common with our ideological enemies than Northerners had with Southerners. They differed on slavery, which obviously is an, is an enormous issue, but they agreed on almost everything else. We don't agree on anything. On anything. And it all ultimately comes down to the God issue. Lincoln didn't go to church much, but he read the Bible every single day. And that's, that was what America was. And the loss of it is an, is an indescribable loss to us and to all of humanity, because Lincoln was right. We are the last best hope for mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, now it's time we for... We have time for questions. Right. Yep. Pastor, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Prager. Really appreciate it. And I do love all those videos. We keep... Uh, Great. Thank you. That gets you. me uh, something to watch while I'm exercising in the morning. We had a discussion earlier about core, um, about our new social study standards. And, and one of the key terms in those social study standards is the term core democratic values. And when we started trying to define what those core democratic values were, 
we found that we had a lot of this separation or disunity. There was no consensus on what core democratic values were in these social studies standards. I was wondering if you could get us your perspective on what you would propose in regards to core democratic values. You mean in the teaching of young people? Look, uh, I don't know how your schools are here. You're in a, you're, you're, you know, you're not in a, in, a, in a major urban area, obviously. They may have great values. In general, if I were raising young kids today, I don't think I would send them to school. Uh, if, I, if there was a school that reflected my values, of, of course, that's my first choice. But, like I tell parents, if you send your kids to college, and, and, uh, and I think you, you can and should, but you need to know something, you're playing Russian roulette with their values. There is at least a 50-50 chance, even if you are conservative, that they will come home and have contempt for everything you value, and that will be a rift. As much as you love them, it will be a rift as long as they live. There was a pastor who took a, a cruise. I take cruises every year with, with my listeners. And uh, he, you know, I get to know the people, most of the people on the cruise, obviously. So he came over to me and he told me that he had uh, three sons and they have uh, PhDs from Princeton, Stanford, and Harvard. So most Americans would go, wow. And he said, but uh, Dennis, uh, they're all on the left. They reject everything I stand for. We get along fine, but my heart is broken. And I wish they never went to those schools to begin with. I don't even, core democratic values is a meaningless phrase. Democracy means the rule of the majority. There, that, that's what, that's, therefore, I don't care. Core democratic values is already somewhat meaningless. I mean, for example, we, we're not a democracy. You might as well say core Republican values, small r, not, not capital R, because we're founded to be a republic, not a democracy. If we were a democracy, we would have, the U.S. Senate would not exist. The Electoral College would not exist. We would just have, everything would be majority vote. That's a democracy. We weren't set up to be that. We were set up. So that already is troubling. Why don't we do core American values? That's, that's what should be taught. And, 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 and we know the core American values. Just have every kid take out his coin and read them. In God we trust, e pluribus unum and liberty. What else need be said? Everything else is commentary. That is America standing on one leg. Mr. Prager, thank you for coming. Thank you. I enjoy your videos. They Great. seem to be geared for college and high school students. I have two daughters in elementary school, and I'm hearing things when they come home, hearing things that they learned that concern me. And they're at a pub public school. Do you think most of your videos are, are age appropriate? Not that there's something that would be um, scandalous or something like that for my girls to watch. How old are your girls? Nine and ten. But, right. but just something that at their level they could, they could uh, grasp hold of. I think they could watch every single video with the possible exception of one which I did titled He Wants You. And it is about, uh, even though your, uh, your husband or boyfriend is looking around on the beach, uh, he really wants you. So uh, it's, it's actually a terrifically encouraging marital video, but it's, it's an adult theme. Yep. Can you, he needs a mic again. Oh. Would you consider adding more videos that are targeted for that age? Uh, yes, I don't we, have a, we, I, we would consider it, uh, but uh, God in his infinite wisdom has only given us 24 hours a day. <laughs> and even though I only sleep five and a half, that already reduces it to 18 and a half. Because so I, <laughs> uh, I never mention this publicly. This is public, obviously, but I don't mention it on the radio or at the website. I edit every single video. I'm the final editor. And uh, 
because I have a gift, I, I fully acknowledge it, for clarity, and that's part of the reason they're effective. And by the way, this is really touching. We have very, very accomplished people, four Pulitzer Prize winners and major thinkers in the world, major figures in, uh, on television, give videos. They all agree to the changes because they're all committed to giving the best talk they can give and not having their ego get in the way. It's been a very touching experience to work with them. But uh, I, I think nine or ten, with you sitting next to them, it's only five minutes. I think you should try. Yes. Um, I have a little bit of a two-part question, one kind of humorous in one regard. How did your conducting go with the orchestra? But um, the, other, the other thing that's more important is um, I'm a pastor. I'm advocating for pastors to get politically involved. I belong to Salt and Light Global as the theologian in residence. And what I've been finding out is I've been trying to share these issues with pastors. There's an outright rejection of anything that kind of smacks with like, let's get involved and let's let's use the Christian worldview, the natural law worldview, to um, undergird our um, not only our nation but our ethics and our values. And the reception that I get from most pastors is, well, we don't want to be called homophobic or Islamophobic. And our forefathers were the ones who stood in the pulpits and right. gave America a moral compass. Okay. What would you advise in order to have? Uh, Pastors reached. I'll address the conducting issue after this one because, as you say, this is more important. Although that was important for other reasons. But uh, I will just tell you, I know what you say is true, and here is a very simple answer, and you, if you, it's up to you whether you tell them or not. These pastors, in my opinion, along with rabbis and priests who have these values and don't fight, uh, do not fear God. They fear the New York Times. Uh, one of the sad uh, conclusions I have reached in life, but I'm fine with it. I, I, I know that we are fallen and the human species is, is troubled. But it's been a sad realization about how many religious people aren't really religious. And that, to me, is the litmus test. Do you fear God? Or do you feel being called Islamophobic, homophobic, racist, bigoted, uh, xenophobic, etc.? Which do you fear more? And the answer is, you said it. Now, I was, I was going to say it. You said it to your great credit. That's what they fear, not God. And uh, it's true. I, I say the same thing to the Orthodox rabbinate. Forget the, con the conservative and reform. It's like mainstream Protestantism. It's lost. Their religion is leftism, and their and but they appear in the in the garb of their religion. It's like uh, you know, mainstream Protestant churches are generally uh, leftism with a cross, and uh, the non-orthodox uh, Jewish synagogues are leftism with the yarmulke. It's it's uh, or, or with the Torah, but it's the same thing. They're, they they're. Um, they're, it's sort of a masquerade. And a lot of these people are sweet, by the way, and, and well-intentioned, though of course that means nothing. Good intentions means nothing. Have I been clear? It means nothing. Uh, so that's what you can tell them. Just say, you fear being called these things? So tell me, who do you fear more? The, the media or God? That's, that's the answer to these. The conducting was a very interesting issue. Some of you know of it. Uh, it was a national issue. The New York Times covered it, N National Public Radio, in all in their distorted ways. I, was an, I, I am an amateur conductor. I conduct orchestras periodically. And uh, I was invited to conduct the Santa Monica Symphony Orchestra at, at one of the greatest halls in the world, the Walt Disney Concert Hall. It was a huge honor. And I said yes. And then uh, the um, manure hit the fan uh, because uh, Santa Monica is the most left-wing city in Southern California. It's like the Berkeley of Southern California. The ex-mayor said, uh, I am not going to the concert. No one should go. No one should play. Prager is a bigot and went through the, the usual list of things. 
uh, uh, two of the players in the orchestra were professors at UCLA, sent out a letter, we're not playing for this bigot, you shouldn't play either. And no one should go to the concert. Anyway, I wrote about it, it made national attention, it sold out. The entire Walt Disney Concert Hall was sold out. It was an amazing thing. It, it was one of the, uh, it was truly a, an unbelievably moving evening. It ended, by the way, with 2,300 people standing and singing America the Beautiful, while the orchestra played it, its permanent conductor played the saw. Are you with me? The industrial saw. That was something you get at a hardware store, and I played the accordion. <laughs> so it was, uh, people were crying. It was so moving. It was just that powerful. But and, and it was a great evening. It was the only time an, a community orchestra sold out uh, the hall. But the attacks on me were virulent, just virulent, and just lies about things that I had said from the New York Times on, and it, it's just, I know what your pastors would have to endure, but I really do fear God. I actually believe I'm gonna have to answer to God, so what the New York Times says about me is secondary. i rather the New York Times say, what a wonderful man. But I don't give a damn what the New York Times says, because if the New York Times ever says I'm a wonderful man, I know I did something wrong. <laughs> First of all, uh, Dennis, it's great to be to see you in person. When I was in Los Angeles from 2000 to 2011, you and uh, Larry Elder were always right. on the radio. So thank, thank you, you for being yes. here. We're My question again. is along the same lines. Um, we tend to, as Lutherans, think about trying to get the message out so that people will debate it and they'll understand it, and then you know, truth will win the day. Talk about what you have to do, even just to keep your message uh, on the air, because I know that th these algorithms now are, are starting to. Uh, edit you out of places it wasn't at YouTube that was you were finding some of their stuff wasn't being played what do you have to do to keep your message out there and w what do we need to learn from that I don't have a perfect answer uh, the, we have 240 videos at Prager University YouTube has restricted 30 of them you know what YouTube restriction means it means that if you have a family filter you can't see it if no school can see it, no library can see it. That's a lot of places that can't show it. And it's supposed to be based on only two things, sexual or violent content. Of course, we have nothing with sexual or violent contact. How is this? This is the ultimate Orwellian joke. YouTube has placed on the restricted list my video of the, I did a video, a five minute video on each of the Ten Commandments. They have put on the restricted list my video, Thou Shalt Not Murder, the Sixth Commandment. Now, isn't that a, it's like a joke. The, the point is, is, if there's violence, so I have a video against violence, and it's restricted. I don't understand why. But it is, maybe because uh, the pacifists don't, don't, I'm serious, maybe the pacifists told YouTube, uh, this is hate, this is a hate video. 30 of the videos, the answer is support from the public. The, the bigger we get, the harder it will be. The Wall Street Journal wrote three editorials on our behalf last year and it didn't help. But with, with the public support, uh, that can help likewise with the radio show you know that's pa you know numbers matter and thank God you know there are a lot of numbers look it's a fight I, I I know this once you make peace with the fact that it's hard to be admired by God and by man at the same time <laughs> You want to be, and it is good, it's a good thing. It's not good to think, I don't care what people think of me. You have to say, I don't care what people think of me if I do the right thing. But, but ideally one does find favor in God's eyes and man's eyes. That is the ultimate dream. But if you have to choose the two, 
I'll end with a biblical teaching. And by the way, I really do hope, not for monetary reasons, I hope you will get my Bible commentary. I promise it will inspire you. And to all pastors here, you will send me a love letter because I am giving you about five years of sermons just in, just in Exodus alone. And I know it's hard each week. But here is my example on, on conflicting who do I want ultimately to serve. So there is a verse in Exodus, and I, I close my eyes because I know it. I think of it in Hebrew, so I have to translate. Um, a man shall fear his mother and father, but keep my Sabbaths. It's, it's translated often and because the Hebrew vi means and or but. There is no word for but in biblical Hebrew. So uh, the, the, the commentators thousands of years ago said, what does one have to do with the other? It's like a non sequitur. A man shall fear his mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. And the answer was very good. Yes, keep my, yes, honor your parents. But if they tell you to violate the Sabbath, you have, you have to uh, keep the Sabbath. In the, so even when parents tell you to do something wrong, God comes first. You have to always respect them, however. You can't dishonor them at any time. But nevertheless, and, and that's why a God-centered life is a good life. And you can't have a God-centered life unless you're in the fight. My, okay, I said that was my last. Here's my last. <laughs> I'm asked often, including I am being interviewed, believe it or not, this is a little scary, by Mother Jones. Mother Jones is doing a big piece on me, and it's a very left-wing journal and very widely read. So no matter who asks me, a religious person or Mother Jones, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? Here it is. Those of you who love God, must hate evil. That should be put up in every church and every synagogue. If you don't hate evil, you don't love God. And if you hate evil, you have to fight. You fight fair, you fight honorably, but you have to fight. You don't want on your tombstone, here lies so and so, everybody liked him. It's not a good sign. Everybody hated him is also not a good sign. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.